one of my habits um, as a pastor and one who preaches is I always make comments about what we have been singing. And um, I call your attention to what we were singing together earlier. O great, o great God of highest heaven. Think about what we were singing together. I was blinded by my sin. I had no ears to hear your voice. I did not know your love within, had no taste for heaven's joys. The writer of this was looking at my life before I came to Christ. Then your spirit gave me life, opened up your word to me through the gospel of your son, gave me endless hope and peace. As I was worshiping with you and listening to you, the first thought that came to my mind was you were singing like over-enthusiastic Americans. <laughs> But then I corrected myself, and I thought, no, you're singing like the body of Christ. No matter if we're in the Philippines or America or no matter where we are in the world, as born-again believers, we should sing with great enthusiasm. Why? Because God has saved us and redeemed us and placed us into his body. And I could not help when I was singing. I turned to look, to hear, look at who was singing. I saw some great expressions of worship. You bless me. And um, I thank you for your worship. First of all, I want to give a few words of thanks. I want to thank Pastor Ali for having us. But as a pastor and one who preaches in a local church on a regular basis, I know the great responsibility of preaching behind what we would call a holy desk. And when I got the email that I was preaching on a Sunday morning, I thought, ooh, it's a great responsibility. Anytime we preach God's word, it's a great responsibility but especially on Sunday morning. Thank you, Pastor Ali. I take this responsibility very seriously. It's a great privilege. And I also want to thank you, Grace Baptist. You have welcomed us. You have put up with our strange accents. You have listened intently as we've tried to listen to you. You've been so warm, and you've made us feel at home, and it's been a joy to be a part of your ministry here, God's ministry. And, and I hope we've blessed you, but I know you've been a blessing to us. And I can't wait to go back to our church and explain to them all that God is, is doing here. And I also want to bring greetings to you from our church, Grace, Grace Life Church of, uh, of Brookhaven, Brookhaven, Mississippi. So if you're looking at the map, you see Alabama there in the south. We're just to the left, to the west of Alabama. And we're a little south and a little east, uh, a little south and a little west in the corner of the state. And I would encourage you to look us up on social media and I ask you to do that so we can stay connected. Um, I don't use Facebook. I use my wife's Facebook, so you can find us there. And uh, I want to connect with you and stay connected with you. And, um, and I hope you do the same thing um, with us. But actually, we really are a part of one big family. Obviously, we're a part of the body of Christ, but we're a part of Anchored in Truth. We are an association of churches around the world who have partnered together to do the work of the ministry, the work of the gospel, the work of the church. And so we're in this thing all together. I know I feel that way. Pastor Ali feels that way. And it is wonderful to be a part of that work. Now, before we get into our passage, I want to pray real quickly because I want to commit my efforts to the Lord and what we're going to do this morning in the message to the Lord. And then we'll get into our, our verses. So let me pray real quick. Lord, we do thank you for all that we've done here in worship this morning. Worship and song, the great fellowship, um, receiving visitors, all that we would call the church. But Lord, now we're here at a place where we're looking into your word and help us to see that we are sanctified by the word of your truth. And we need your spirit to come and take the word, your word, and to apply it into our lives. So I pray you'll help me. Lord, I have nothing good to offer other than what you've been teaching me these past few weeks. And Lord, as I offer my little meager sacrifice of loaves and fish, I pray you'll bless it and multiply it and use it to sanctify us and to sanctify us as a church. And so, Lord, I stand before you and I ask you to do what I cannot do. And I look forward to what you're going to do. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Now, in our message this morning, I want us to be in John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. Pastor Allie read some of those verses earlier. If you would, go ahead and have your Bible turned to chapter 3. and We'll get to those verses here in a moment. 
But here in chapter 3, we have some of the most well-known passages of Scripture found in the Bible. If you know your Bible, many of you do, you know that chapter 3 is famous for this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. We know that in verses 1 to 15, Jesus tells Nicodemus that to enter the kingdom of God, he must be born again. In the English Standard Version, the phrase born again is there two times. And, and also the phrase born of the Spirit is there three times. Now, if you do not know your Bible, I'm sure that you do know the single most famous, most loved verse found in all the Bible, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. But this morning, we're not going to look at all of the chapter, and we're going to look at more than the famous most loved verse, verse 16. This morning, we're going to examine three verses, verse 16, 17, and 18. Let's read them together. We'll start in verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, with just one reading of those verses... We see that there are several things at the heart of what the Lord Jesus is saying here. And I want us to look at these before we divide the verses. First and foremost, we see God the Father. We see God the Father and His great love. And we see His great love not just for a few people or not even for a particular race of people, but we see God's great love for the whole world. Now, a question, why is that important for us to see? This morning, you may see God's love like you've never seen it before, even though you know these verses. But then second, we see the Son. We see God the Son, who is Jesus. And it is implied in the text here that we see Jesus coming to earth to die on the cross as a sacrifice for the sin of men. And actually, we see very little about the Son in the verses, in these three verses. But then third, we see men and mankind. We see the spiritual condition and the position of men and people. And we see that there are only two spiritual conditions and positions. The saved or the unsaved. The uncondemned or the condemned. And we see how a man's spiritual condition and his position relates to eternal life. And eternal life is life without end. And you know we're not good at this. But we need to think about eternal life and life without end more than we know. We can be captivated by the world and, and our life and even good things. And we can fail to contemplate eternity like we should. So simply, here in these verses, we see God's love for the world, which is people, and how people may have eternal life, life without end, without end and life with God. Now at this point, I want to get into the verses and what Jesus is saying here, and we're going to examine what I see two major truths, and I think this will be easy for you to follow. First, we're going to look at God loved the world, and then we're going to look at belief and unbelief. Now, as I preach in my local church, it's not my church, I have the habit of saying to my folks, you, you take notes, you, you write down, you take notes for your own study. And what I mean by that is this, I would encourage you to take what's taught in in God's Word, and make sure you take it home with you to study it and absorb all that the Lord would have you to absorb and, and, and see. So number one, God so loved the world. Now we know the verse, but listen to verse 16 again, the first portion. For God so loved the world. Now just with those six words, we see quite a lot about who God is. In verse 16, we do see a demonstration or an expression of God's love, but we must see that all God did came out of who God is. That's an important statement, so I'm going to repeat that. We must see that all that God did came out of who He is. 1 John 4.8 tells us that God is love. 
And this shows us that by His very nature, God is love. And that tells us that God demonstrated His love because of who He is. By His very nature, He is loving. And it is not that God chose to love, so then He demonstrated that love. God never chooses to love. To say that God chose to love would imply that God could choose not to love. By His very nature, God is loving. He has always loved and is always loving. And out of this never-beginning, never-ending love, He demonstrated that love by giving His one and only Son. But notice the verse says that God loved the world. And we need to see that this world is a non-specific word for humanity. This speaks of humanity in a general sense, like we would say men or mankind or people. That's easy for us to understand. So we see that God loved the world, and this would be all of humanity or all men or all mankind. I like what the Bible scholar Leon Morris says here. He says that all of this is a distinctly Christian idea. It is. And he goes on to say that God's love is wide enough to embrace all mankind. I love that. God's love is wide enough to embrace all mankind. But notice something with me. This one phrase, for God so loved the world, was and can be a shock for two groups of people. First, this was a shock for the Jews. In Jesus' day, Pastor Ali read the encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus. He was a Jew. And this was a great shock for those Jewish people. They believed that God loved the Jews. And they could not comprehend God loving the Gentiles or non-Jewish people. They actually believed that when the Messiah came, he would judge all of the Gentile peoples. And this is very important to see because how the Jews saw these things plays a major part in what these verses truly mean. But then second, this can be a shock for some who are reformed in their theology. Yes, we believe in a limited atonement. I like to say that we believe in a particular atonement. We believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that he died for a particular people. That would be the church. Ephesians 5.25 says that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So when we hear this phrase, for God so loved the world, there are some within the Reformed world that can resist that statement. And I have known people who are Reformed in their faith, and they have resisted any teaching that speaks in these terms. They're afraid of universalism. They're afraid of some view, wrong view, of the atonement. Of course, we know this verse does not teach some kind of universal atonement. And this also does not mean that God somehow approves the sinfulness of men and people. But think on what we have just seen here. Jesus says, for God so loved the world. We know the verse. God is love. God always has and always will love and always will be loving. And by his very nature, he is love. And because he is love, he loved and he loves the world. And the world is all people. Now, at this point, I want to ask two questions. I want you to think with me. Rhetorical questions. Let's use our minds spiritually and think with me here. First, how did God demonstrate that love? It's one thing to say that you love, but how did God demonstrate that love? And then second, what was God's purpose in all of these things? Simply, why did he do this? So the first question, how did God demonstrate that love? We see that in the second part of the verse. Listen to the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Here we see that God demonstrated his love by giving his only son to die on the cross for the sin of men. Of course, the cross is implied in the verses. But notice something that is clearly stated in the verses. The cross and Christ's death on the cross is a demonstration of the Father's love. The verse does not say that the cross is a demonstration of the Son's love. Of course, we know that Christ loved and gave himself up for us, Galatians 2.20. But here in this verse, we see that God gave his only son, and the cross is a demonstration of God's love. One commentator said, the atonement proceeds out of the loving heart of the Father of God. The Father, God. Let me say that again because we're going to hold on to that. 
The atonement proceeds out of the loving heart of God. Now look at the depth of this love. It is not just that God loved the world. He demonstrated that love by giving that which cost Him the most. He gave His one and only Son, and He even gave Him up to death on a cross. Now what's my point here? We must see that the cross and Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross comes out of God's heart of love. The cross is a demonstration of God's love. The cross reveals God's very nature, which is love. Remember what I said earlier. The atonement proceeds out of the loving heart of God. But why? What is the purpose in all of these things? We see that in the third portion of the verse. Listen to the verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Here we clearly see why God the Father lovingly gave His only Son to die on the cross. He gave His Son so that men may not perish but have eternal life. And this is seen in both the positive and the negative. This is easy to see. He gave His Son to die so that men may believe and not perish. So there's the positive. But if they do not believe, they certainly do perish. That's the negative. If they do believe, they escape God's final judgment of sin and eternal punishment and damnation. That's the positive. But if they do not believe, they do not escape God's final judgment and damnation. That would be eternal life in hell. That's the negative. But notice, both. Both inherit eternal life. Both. One with God in heavenly bliss and one in hell in eternal damnation and punishment. Both inherit eternal life because all men are eternal beings. Those who believe and those who do not believe have eternal life. The only question is, where? Now what's my point here? We must see that all human life is eternal all people possess life without end. All men and people will spend eternity in one of those two places. And I'm going back to what I said earlier. We must ponder these things. We are trapped in time and human history, but we must ponder eternity. Eternity is put in our hearts by God the Father, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And we have a nasty sinful habit of not pondering eternity. Many times until it's too late. One of the things I did when we went door to door and when we witnessed in your wonderful city was if someone was pondering over sickness and death, if they were thinking about eternity, even for just a moment, I would rush to that. Because why? Men and mankind need to be made to think about eternity. And I know I look 25, but I'm just a little older and the older I get, the older I get, the more fleeting this life is. And eternity is coming faster and faster. And sir, ma'am, young person, I beg you to contemplate eternity. Eternity is right around the corner. Even if you live a long and productive and fruitful life. So in summary, here in verse 16, we see that God has demonstrated this great unimaginable love. We cannot contemplate that love. This love for all of humanity. He revealed His love by sending His Son to die on the cross for men so that, that beautiful term, whoever would believe on Him would have eternal life with Him. Simply, God is love. So He gave that which cost Him the most so that we may have eternal life with Him. So that is John 3.16. The most famous, arguably the most loved verse in the Bible. And if I could put it into an analogy, I have simply been trying to climb the highest spiritual mountain that there is. What's the highest spiritual mountain in Scotland? You know. You might not know this, but I've been to the top of Mount Everest. But I was in an airplane. <laughs> On a mission trip to India, we were flying east and west, and the uh, gentleman I was with that did some mission work in India, he said, look out the window. I said, yes. He said, that's the Himalayas. I said, yes. He said, notice their eye level. 
the height of those mountains became a little obvious. But what I'm showing you is this. John 3.16 is the highest spiritual mountaintop that there is. And I've simply been trying to climb it and to take you along with me. But there's more. Continuing with God so loved the world, we need to look at verse 17. Let's look at the verses. Or you can listen as I read them. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that he, he might, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Now here in verse 17, Jesus was simply continuing on with what he had taught in verse 16. He was continuing to contradict and to correct the false view of the Jews. Again, he was using the positive and the negative. And what Jesus was saying was this. The purpose of God in sending His Son and the point of the Son giving Himself was not to bring judgment on the world. But of course, if we know our Bibles, we know that there are times when Jesus did say that He had come to judge. One instance is John 9, 39. Jesus says, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see, that do not see may see and those who see may become blind. So what do we do with this seeming contradiction? And this is very important for us to see. We must see that salvation for some invariably brings judgment for others. The fact that some do not believe automatically brings judgment upon them. So God's purpose and plan was to provide salvation to all the world. Yes, all of the world. And we can't be afraid of that phrase. Not that all of the world would be saved, no. We know that all people will not be saved. We are not some type of universalists. And we know that Jesus was not teaching some kind of universalism. He was not teaching even some kind of a potential salvation or atonement. We must see that God's purpose and plan was to provide salvation well beyond the Jewish people to all of the different peoples of the world. We see that salvation will finally come to all the peoples of the world Revelation 7, verses 9 to 10. Listen to what John says. After this, I looked and, I, and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. And what were they doing? Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And look, this was shocking and revolting to the Jewish people. And that was because they believed that God's Messiah would save them and judge all of the others. They were spiritual snobs and then some. So look at what we have here in these two verses. God demonstrated His love for all people. He did so by sending His Son to the earth to die on the cross for men so that whoever, I love that word, Whoever would believe on Him would have eternal life with God. God did not send His Son to earth to judge the world. He sent His Son so that a great multitude that no one could number from every tribe, from, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages so that they could believe and have eternal life with Him. But a legitimate question for you, for me as a pastor, and the one preaching, why have I taken so much time with verse 16 and 17? You might have thought, why can't he move along? There's a purpose, folks. We must see that the cross and the atonement comes out of the loving heart of God. And this atonement is for the world. People from every nation, tribes, peoples, and languages. We must understand this. And look at how this relates to and applies to us right here today. If we are born again people, oh, I've had the privilege of hearing many of your testimonies. As a matter of fact, some of you have drawn near to me through the week and asked me my testimony. I've heard of some of you, how you've come to faith in Christ. And if we are born again people, the scripture says that the love of God has been put in us. Isn't that right? Right now, some of you are thinking of a verse. Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God has, poured, has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit of God 
who has been given to us. So notice the love of God that I have been trying to explain. It has been put within us. And the atonement should proceed out of our hearts as well. God the Father desires to save people from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And that same love and that same desire to see the world believe on Christ, it should proceed out of our hearts as well. Isn't that right? In my good old American way of saying it, that should just be normal Christianity. And what has this week been about? Many things. But one thing has been taking the gospel, knocking on doors, sharing our faith, witnessing. It's been about the love of God proceeding out of our hearts, desiring that men and women and people who might not look like we do would come to faith in Christ. And if that's not what is in your heart, if that is not what is motivating you, you might need a correction. Oh, how we forget. Oh, how we ease away from these things. Oh, how we just slide off into being apathetic and we go through the motions. Look, church, look, people. The love of God is in us and these things should come out of us. And I will make a, a little confession. The whole time I've been with you this week, I have been reminded of the importance of evangelism. It's easy to become evangelistic on the mission field and it's easy to become comfortable back home. And I need to lead my church to be a little more purposeful in our evangelism. And Pastor Ali has been an encouragement to me and a correction for me. And you have too. Why? Because I must live this as well. So let me move on. Finally, to our second major truth. This is what I call belief and unbelief. And this will be a little shorter. And this is what we see here in verse 18. Belief and unbelief. Let's read verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, we have already seen that certain facts have been established. By His very nature, God is love, and He demonstrated His love by sending His Son to die as the atonement for sin. And God sent His Son so that men may believe on Him and so that they may have eternal life with Him. Right? We've established those facts. Well, here in verse 18, Jesus just takes, the, takes things one step further. Here Jesus is emphasizing the need for personal faith. He is saying that it is not enough for God to send His Son. It is not enough for the Son to give Himself up to die on the cross for sin. Personal faith must be exercised. Personal faith must be appropriated. People must, they must believe in order to be saved. And Jesus continues to speak in the positive and the negative. And he contrasts the one who believes up against the one who does not. So simply what I want to do here is look at both. First, the one who believes. Listen to the beginning of verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Simply, the one who believes, the one who exercises faith, is not condemned. This means they are not under judgment in life and in eternity. They have been set free from eternal, eternal punishment and a punishment that they deserve. Now why? It's because they have believed. I like what A.T. Robertson, the scholar, says here. And I'm quoting. He says, trust in Christ prevents condemnation. For He, that's Christ, takes our place and pays the penalty for sin for all who put their case in His hands. The believer in Christ as Savior does not come into judgment. So the one who believes. And then second, the one who does not believe. Listen to the second portion of verse 18. Forever, for whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Simply, the one who does not believe, the one who does not exercise faith, is already under judgment. They, already, they are already condemned. This means that they do not have to wait until the final judgment to be judged and condemned. They have already been judged, and they are already under condemnation. 
their own persistence and unbelief has closed them up to judgment. I like what John MacArthur says here. I'm quoting. He says, while the final sentencing of those who reject Christ is still future, their judgment will merely consummate what is already begun. Now listen, friend. Listen. Listen close. I know it's warm and we might be tempted to doze here. Listen. If you are in unbelief, you are condemned already. You are condemned already. You're just waiting on the consummation of that condemnation. So many people in the life of the church that are not converted to Christ, they feel that everything is okay. They do not see the weight of their condemnation. You are already condemned. And that should be spiritual motivation enough for you to rush to Christ this morning. And just in case there may be any confusion or doubt here, in the last phrase, Jesus clears that up. Jesus repeats and emphasizes what He has already taught. This makes me feel good. Jesus is repeating Himself. So when I repeat myself, maybe I'm being a little Christ-like. <laughs> Listen to the last part of the verse. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Jesus is saying, and I'm putting all of this into my words, whoever does not believe is condemned already. They are waiting for that final sentencing. Why? Why are they waiting for that final sentencing? Because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. They choose, they choose to remain in unbelief. And you know, yesterday while we were on the streets witnessing so many rejected, so many cursed, so many said no, so many declined, and they were choosing to remain in unbelief, so many on the doorstep, but more personal. Are you choosing to remain in unbelief? Does Jesus repeat these things because you need to hear them a second and a third time? So in summary, look what we see here in verse 18. Those who believe and those who do not believe. It's real simple. And their condition and position. Those who believe are not condemned. They are free from judgment. And those who do not believe are condemned already. They are just waiting on the consummation of what has already begun. You see that? Why? Why? Because they refuse to believe and they stay in that refusal to believe. And for us today, we need to see that there are only two classes of people. There are only two classes of people. There are those who believe and those who refuse to believe. And my question for you is this, which are you? We have two sides, the right or the left. One time when I was a little boy, I went to church with my great aunt who was a precious older saint and there were two doors to the front of the church and she said, we enter to the right, the sheep go to the right, the goats go to the left. She was rather humorous. There are two sides. There are only two people. Those who believe are those who are condemned because they refuse to believe. Which are you? Where are you? And look, if you are in unbelief, if you have not been born again, you are condemned. Please see that. Life may be good externally, but you are condemned already. You are judged already, and you are just waiting on the consummation of your judgment. That could come tomorrow, or it could come 20 years from now. One of the things we struggle with in the states, particularly in the southern part of the states, we live in the Bible Belt. Everyone is religious. Everyone professes Christ. Everyone goes to church. Everyone's been baptized. But many are external Christians. It's merely a profession. And they live a good life. God has blessed them with common grace. And it's hard for them to see and understand that no, they are condemned already because of their unbelief. And many are even very good external Christians, even better external Christians than me. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're even a very good, respected external Christian, but yet you know you've not believed, you've not been born again. And I would beg you, come to Christ. The reason Nicodemus had such a hard time is he could not let go of his external religion. Now as I begin to close, 
I want you to think on the theme of the topic that I was assigned to preach, life without end. In Bible terms, eternal life. That is the title of my message, eternal life or life without end. And all men are created as eternal beings. That is a part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Although we die a physical death, we live on in eternity. And God so loved the world of sinful, vile, wicked people that He sent His Son to die in the place of men so that whoever believes in Him should not perish in hell for all of eternity, but they may have eternal life with Him in heaven in heavenly bliss if they believe. Now as I close, here's my invitation. Not to come to me. If you need Pastor Alley, if you need Christman, if you need any of the leaders here, they would be glad to counsel with you. But my invitation is not to come to me, but to go to Christ. Because Christ is the only one that can save. So right now, I want to pray quickly, and I want to commit what we've studied to the Lord, and commit you to the Lord, and then I'll turn it over to Pastor Alley. Lord God, I thank you that out of your wonderful, unimaginable love, you sent your Son. And I thank you that you made a way for me. The most wicked, the most vile sinner. But you loved me and you gave yourself for me. And not just for me, but you gave yourself for the people of Scotland. The people all around these streets and neighborhoods. You gave yourself for our sons and our daughters. And Lord God, I pray that by the power and the work of the Holy Spirit of God, you would bring that young person, that mother, that father, that young man, that young woman, that you would bring them the faith in Christ even today so that you could receive the praise and the honor and the glory out of their life that you so deserve. We love you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your great love. And as the people of God, I pray that we will always have your heart in all of these things. And we ask these things in the wonderful name of your son, Jesus. Amen.